Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Harkins. I am the Events Associate for the French American Chamber of Commerce in New York Chapter, and we're happy to welcome you to our panel discussion today on technology within healthcare. Just a very quick word about our organization before we begin. The French American Chamber of Commerce's mission is to provide the opportunities, experiences, and understanding that empower successful business relationships between and for members. The FACC New York Chapter counts a mosaic of a thousand members representing sectors from tech to food, health, finance, and other professional services. This panel will last about an hour or so. Um, feel free to send in any questions at any time by using your question function, and the speakers will do their best to get to each and every one. Um, of course, this session will be recorded, so don't worry about missing a thing. Now, I, I don't want to take up any more time away from our speakers, so I will hand it over to our moderator slash uh, speaker participant, Philippe Koliki, and he will get things going. Philippe? Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you hear me well, uh, that we don't have uh, connection troubles. Uh, I am uh, Philippe Koliki. A uh, few words about myself. I have been in healthcare for nearly 30 years. Big pharma, but also a pharmacist by training. And uh, recently, with friends um, that have a similar background as I, we created a company called Opticomics. Um, we have a bold goal it is to improve uh, the health of patients with dementia. Um, and to oversimplify it, what we want to accomplish is to turn a smartphone into a medical device. And that smartphone, um, what we want to accomplish is to promote health. Uh, functioning to preserve memory and independent living, but also we want to address uh, medical complications that uh, have a negative impact on memory, like hypertension. Um, as I said, we are a data company, so what everything we do it wants to be evidence-based, um, and we want to generate evidence to show the benefit of a solution that meets uh, regulatory standards, but also payer standards, so that the, the users have confidence um, into the solution we bring. So these are a few words about myself. I will hand it over to David and then to Thomas for them to introduce themselves, and then from there we go into a lively conversation. Hope. Thank you, Philippe. David. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Bonjour à tous. Uh, J'espère que vous allez bien. Hope everybody is, uh, is doing great in, this, uh, in those times. Um, I'm a French surgeon specialized in uh, uh, pediatric cardiac surgery, um, based in New York, been trained uh, in France. And for the past 20 years, I've been working in uh, different countries, from the Caribbean to uh, several countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, Probably 20 years ago, we started to use technology to deliver healthcare uh, for the most vulnerable. And right now, uh, through my foundation called the Heart Fund, uh, we provide um, cardiovascular care in uh, developing countries. And uh, Absolutis is our venture studio where we're building a health venture and initiative in partnership with corporation, funders, and government uh, to improve the health, uh, not only delivery, but as well uh, health outcome uh, for the patient and especially focusing on democratizing health for the most vulnerable. So really happy to discuss how you know, technology and, uh, and different mindset can improve uh, healthcare and the health of people globally. So it's a pleasure to, to be on the panel. Thank you for the invitation. Excellent. Thomas? Sorry, I'm actually <laughs> just moving in today. Uh, my name is Thomas Closel. I'm a former oncologist trained in, the, in France and New York, Cornell. And very happy to meet all of you. I think we're with losing. Research with AI. Um, and we have raised uh, 70 Thomas, million in our A round, uh, backed by Google as our main investors. Yeah. Thomas, I think it might be better if you turn your webcam Sorry. off so we can hear you. No, it's better. Okay. Is it working on? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we are um, applying um, uh, really edge technologies in machine learning, uh, uh, trying to really improve medical research uh, and really especially developing one technology that is called federated learning which is just a way to access data without having to take the data out of the hospitals. So data stays on premise and it's really privacy preserving and really respecting, respecting patients' rights. So it's a new way to build AI, but data never leaves. Only the algorithm travels and this is quite cool and new. So happy to discuss with Philippe and David that I 
um, known of like everyone else <laughs> and very happy to discuss with them this topic. Excellent. So um, I understand the um, the audience is not necessarily healthcare, so we do not try to make healthcare not as complicated because typically when healthcare people talk about healthcare, they make it super complicated. So let's uh, let's try to make it as simple as pie. Um, what we will try to address all together, have a conversation on, is uh, it's great time to be healthcare. We get more access to data, and that data helps to transfer healthcare. So that's a topic we will try to touch and, and make it um, understandable for everyone. Also on the panel, you have two doctors, you have a pharmacist. Uh, we'll talk about how scientists in general uh, use more real world evidence and data to drive decisions and, and practice, but also in research. Um, we're so pleased to have Toma, he's our AI expert and he's gonna make it as simple as possible. So we'll talk a little bit about machine learning and how machine learning is used. And also um, we'll think about uh, everyone on the, on the panel, on the uh, audience, we'll talk a little bit about wellness and, and well-being for employees, particularly in, in a time like to, uh, are we living in COVID. So here, this is what you can expect from uh, us. Um, so uh, I will start for you, uh, with you. Uh, and as I said, this is a time where in medicine, we collect more and more data. If you think about the US, it's roughly more than a billion data points or medical information that is collected on a yearly basis um, and that is captured into what we call an EHR or electronic health record so it seems complicated it seems a daunting task um, can you help us a little bit to understand what's an EHR or electronic health record and what's its purpose because this is something that uh, you use uh, regularly in, 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 in your company so help us to start with uh, uh, explaining EHR and how they capture data and how that can be utilized. Yeah, so EHR, uh, for, for everyone, EHR is just one part of the data points in the patients. EHR is called electro electronic health record, so it's literally the, the health record, the written health record that every patient has uh, when he enters a hospital. Uh, this is a lot of data points. Every clinical feature is a data point, his age, uh, his disease type, his outcome. You also have a lot of other data points that are non-EHR, like medical images, a CT scan, uh, or his genomic patterns. Uh, the problem with EHR is uh, its diversity, especially in the US, because in the US, every EHR, they try to get EHR that are not really transferable from one hospital to the other because it's a competitive landscape and people don't want you to go from a hospital A to hospital B. <laughs> it's really business, right? As usual. So um, there is a lot of problem of uh, EHR heterogeneity uh, in the US. And of course, um, uh, an EHR in the US is not very different from the EHR in France. In EHR in France, it's completely unstructured. Sometimes it's written by hand. So you need to apply different technology when you try to analyze a handwritten <laughs> uh, and unstructured EHR from a, an American one that will be more like computer-based. So this is just the type of landscape you have. Uh, and this is one of the problems of AI, is AI is trained on data, and data has to be some kind of normalized to be able to, 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 to have a meaning and to be robust. And this is one of the big problems in AI, is how you can find a way to to normalize all these data sets that can be very different. But. Correct. So, so tell me more about the, the opportunities that are ahead of us because uh, we have more data, so captured in, in a good or bad way, but uh, but where where you see the opportunity in terms of transformation uh, and, and, and also then I have another question for Dan David is more from a daily perspective, how, where you see the opportunity as a treating physician. So you as a scientist, as a researcher, and David as a more as a practitioner, how you see the opportunity to use the EHR to do better medicine or better science? Yeah, well, so I, I, would, I, I wouldn't like really focus the debate on EHR specifically because EHR is really just yeah, not no. that correct. Thing. Yeah. You, so, um, um, uh, to me, and I was a practitioner too, uh, um, um, uh, all times, um, uh, the problem of data, so you, everybody needs to understand in, in the AI world, so there is the data access part and the data science part. And the data access is how you access the right data to train your model, how you can clean them up, how you can actually have a good database to train your model. And then the data science part is how you build some mathematical formulas, it's called algorithm, uh, uh, that are going to train on this data set. So data access and data science are two these two are two parts of the, what we call AI today. So the data access is how you get the right data. It's very complex. 
uh, because you need the right data that need to be normalized, but they also need to be very heterogeneous because if you train a model in the US, it might not work in Japan and otherwise. So that's very important. And then the, the, the first is what type of data you really want to train your model. The second one is, do you really have the rights to train a model on this data? And uh, David has a lot of like thinking about that, the ethical part and what you can do in different countries. Uh, actually, like the data, if you want to train a model on data in a patient in a hospital in France, let's imagine you want to train a big model on all the CT scan has been done in Paris hospitals. Uh, do we actually have the right to do so? Um, maybe not. And the question is who the data belongs to. And actually, we don't know in France who the data belongs to. If you do a CT scan in Paris hospital, uh, you might think it belongs to you because it's your body, but you're not paying for it. The government is paying for it. So does it belong to you or does it belong to the government? And I think like data property is extremely complex and not um, legiferated. So in France, we don't know who a CT scan of a lung belongs to if you do it in a public hospital. And this is very complex because if you actually like a, if actually um, um, an AI company train a model on your data, if it's yours, it should maybe give you money back, right? Revenue share with you, <laughs> uh, because data is a commodity. It has value, a lot of value. There is a lot of com there is a company today in the US. Um, uh, you can uh, um, actually like uh, um, Nebula Genomics. You can actually sell your genomics and your information, and you just make a genetic test, complete some information about yourself, and if somebody want to buy it, you're gonna make money on your account. You can see your account. So, I mean, the question today is um, uh, the, the, the data is data. Oops. Sky is the limit on data because every data point can make new models of prediction of outcome. You can predict a patient if it's on a rest therapy. You can augment researcher capabilities in being able to analyze things they don't see with their own eyes. But the question is first, who really like, if you want to, how, how can you access the data respecting the people's rights? And before you can answer this question, you need to know who they belong to. And I will just finish by that. There is a, an amazing example of not only data points, but even organs. A placenta, for example, when you give birth uh, in France, no one knows if the placenta belongs to the mother or the, the hospital. And there is actually a really weird situation where the mother wants to take this placenta back home for some traditional, some tradition. Some people actually do things with this placenta. Uh, you can keep the cells, you can do uh, uh, whatever. And, 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 and the hospital in France say, no, 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 it belongs to us. Uh, so it's a funny situation, but data is the limit. Who does it belong to? It's a big question we need to answer. And it needs to be legiferate in the Maybe Emmanuel Macron will come saying in a year, I've decided as a politician that every data produced in France belongs to France. And that's a political decision, it's fine. But today, there isn't, it hasn't happened, no one knows. Gray zone. Yeah, um, and then I think you, about the so. I, I just wanted to add that, you know, everything that we are, us as an individual, we are, we are data, right? When I ask you who you are, your name, your date of birth, where you live, your zip code, your profession, it's a data set. And so nowadays, um, we are data and we are sharing data with everybody in your phone, on Google, with your bank, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember uh, years ago, you know, as a med student, when we were doing grand rounds, uh, we had to get ready before, you know, the, the professor were coming. I don't know if you remember that, Thomas, in, a, in our French hospital, but we have to get the cards with all the, the medical record, right? And, and my dad is a doctor, he's still a doctor. And if you go to his office, you have 20,000, you know, written paper and files in his office. So the question is, who does medical record belongs to? Who owns it? You know, they, they're, they're not really safe. They're in the, in the medical office, you know, uh, with a lock, the door that is locked. Uh, but that's it, who owns it? Who's doing what with? Uh, with the data and and so that's what happened right now in uh, in different hospital uh, all over the world so working in in uh, on the continent for instance in africa now you have policies that say every data has to be owned by uh, either uh, the uh, uh, the individual and but stay in the country you cannot transfer data outside of the country and then you, you know you know that really well thomas it's really hard uh, to make you know clinical trial and use data from different uh, different country, different continent, different policies. So I think, uh, first of all, is what do we do with the data without going, you know, uh, in details and too deep in what we use the health data, but because everybody now is, you know, is a package of data. We are a bundle of data, including health data. What do we do with it and who owns it? And I think uh, the opportunity, and that's, you know, to answer your question, Philippe, the opportunity is to see that, you know, more globally in a way that we integrate health data now everywhere, 
you know, for instance, in, entr in entrance, right? You, have a, you want a entrance policy or you want to ensure your, you want to, uh, uh, you know, have a loan for your real estate, they ask you for data, right? And so all those data right now are becoming an asset. And who owns the asset? I think that's that's a great uh, that's a great discussion. Uh, a lot of, uh, of policymakers are thinking about it. But you know, we need as well advocacy group, as you know, individual, as patient, uh, making sure that you know we have access to those data when we need it. We can share that with the people that needs to be uh, uh, you know being able to consult those data, but as well to be aware, like your family. You, I want to share that with my wife, uh, you know, with my children. How can I do that? You know, do I have to ask, you know, the hospital to give permission? That's really hard. And so I think right now is health data sovereignty belongs to who? And I think uh, to my personal point of view, particularly it should be the patient and it should allow the right and maybe license, you know, like you said, Thomas, there is many companies now entering the space, license those data to whoever they want. But having the choice is uh, is probably the freedom of, of you know, and in the, in the future of health data. And to be very interesting. So to... I see... Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, I, I just wanted to say something else. Is uh, um, the, the, and David made a really good point. And the, 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 to add to what David said, is also the question that so who the data belongs to? Does it belong to the patient or the hospital? Can we aggregate them? But the last question is, if we are okay to share it, can we de-identify it? That's also a question that the audience needs to understand. Is uh, if you share, if you're okay that your data are being shared or sold to a company? And you know that Google is buying data every day. We, we call, and the hospitals in the US are called data providers because they just sell to Google or to Optum every day. Um, uh, can it, can it, uh, to add to the reflection of the data property, it needs to, you need, we also need to understand, can we today buy data and anonymize data sets? And the, the answer is no. Today, there is no really good way to be 100% sure that your identity won't be back uh, when somebody analyzes a data set. The reason is, Today, um, it's 23andMe, the, the reason. Uh, actually, 4% of the US population has made a 23andMe test. It's number one on Christmas gifts on Amazon. What does it mean? It just means that whenever you have some genomic patterns in, in one of your data sets, you can always cross it with this database because some part of this database of 23andMe are public. You can accept on 23andMe to make your data public. And you can actually uh, uh, come back to the to to a cousin with your uh, the crossing your data with this public genome database, and therefore today there is absolutely no way. This is how the the killer of the Golden Gate was was caught. Uh, his DNA of his hair was crossed with a 23andMe database, and we find the name of a cousin of his. And today, uh, with this. Uh, Patterns, you cannot identify or perfectly anonymize data sets. And therefore, all the regulations around GDPR and HIPAA about around data protection are made about the best efforts to identify data sets. And it really means what it means. It means you cannot do it perfectly well. And if you're okay to share your own data sets, you also have to be sure that even if you think it's de identify, if you put 50 or 100 hackers on it, they will come back to your cousin or whatever or yourself. And you cannot be 100% sure. So I think it's very important to also think, and um, just want to say that, to, to about how you think about data in the future. Mm -hmm. So we, right. we see data is, is critical. So there's more data. Um, the question of who belongs to data. Uh, let's let's say for the patient, and, and, uh, and David, I want to get your perspective on how can the data that now uh, with the phone technology, you have your data on your phone. Uh, how can you combine that knowledge that, and, and then use it for your own benefit, increasing your health literacy. How can you use it in your perspective to become healthier? So owning its data, having access to its data in a very simple way, isn't it an opportunity for everyone, not just the doctors, but also for the patients to become a driver of health? And where you see the opportunity, how you see how you see this moving forward. Um, I know you have worked some in this area. I work in this area, so you're a little bit ahead of, of, of me with some of your companies where you use data and, and provide data to patients to help them prevent uh, future, future medical conditions. Um, so where you see the opportunity for patients acting on data? So, uh, okay, so I think there is, there is the data part, but data is only uh, a, a translation of real life, right? So let's say I'm a smoker and I don't ex exercise. I know exactly what it what it means, right? It means I smoked, you know, 10 cigarettes a day, 
and I only work, you know, maybe one mile a week. So those data already what I leave. This is what I do, right? If you translate those data and, and this lifestyle in terms of number on Excel sheets or in an app or in an electronic medical record, and then you, you combine that, you compound that with you know 10,000 people, then you can have pattern and trends, okay? So I think that um, having access to your own data, uh, having access to knowledge, right, can help a practitioner and the healthcare system to personalize intervention for clinical intervention for the patient, right? So I want to know that David, Thomas, and Philip are different, you know, in terms of lifestyle and risk factor, but I don't want to provide the same intervention for the three of us, right? Because it doesn't work this way. And usually research works, you know, in, in aggregating different data and putting that for the global population. Now, what I think is really interesting is I can really personalize my lifestyle according to my own data every day and then change it and enter day, not six months when I see my cardiologist for the next follow-up, but the next day. If I haven't exercised too much or, or enough, you know, this day, or I had a big meal, then I have to exercise tomorrow, right? Um, and so that's where you really adapt and, and everybody can become his own, you know, practitioner. I wouldn't say doctor without, you know, prescri prescribing and, and doing automedication, but at least you can take care of your own health because you understand your data, you understand and you have knowledge. So I think, first of all is, um, are you, um, do you have enough knowledge? And that you can understand that with data, right? I can ask you a question and I will understand that you know about hypertension, you know about, you know, diabetes, you know about, you know, obesity. And you know, those, those are, you know, with cancer and mental health, those chronic condition are the number one uh, um, killer in the world. So they are preventable. So you can use that as a prediction and as a prevention. If I know exactly what are your risk factors, what is your lifestyle, what do you eat, how you exercise, what is your environment? And health data is only one part. Your biomarker, your glucose, or your troponine are only a minimal part of the whole data set that you can get from you know, the, where you live, do you have access to internet, do you have access to healthy food, uh, do you have access to a doctor, and that's usually something that you know I don't ask as 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 a you know as a physician because obviously you should have access to it. But on a global scale, if you look at it on a global scale on every continent, this is not the majority of the population. So 80% of the world doesn't have access to what we think is normal in the West, right? Access to drug, uh, water, safe food, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I think health is really uh, health and well-being is a is a global. I think entity where health data, and when I would say health data is your biomarker as, as an individual, can be you know, harnessed to predict and to prevent disease earlier than, than before. i give you one example. Um, we, we launched a study two years ago, probably three years ago uh, in, in Africa for the screening of uh, hypertension in the global population. And, uh, and in, in Ivory Coast, in Abidjan, we looked at uh, that 70 percent 17 percent right is one fifth almost one fifth of the global population at severe hypertension and severe hypertension without knowing it so only one data you know for you know 2000 patients just gave us you know a sense of public health and global health the access to diagnosis the access to knowledge because they didn't know main uh, you know the majority didn't know what uh, a severe hypertension was and the risk and especially that was a great tool now that we had those data to come back you know, to the institution and say part of the population uh, is really sick and they don't know about it. So information is important, screening is important, but having access to the right treatment, the right doctors and affordable, uh, affordable treatment uh, is, is the way to go. So I think you, know, you can use data in a preventive manner and personalize it for one, one patient if you're a doctor, but if you, you know, policymaker, you can use millions of data to change the way a country acts, the way you protect your population, and and based on science. And that's why it's really important. You know, that's that's our work as a as a doctor. And once you're a doctor, you're a doctor forever. You have to think like a doctor, even if you develop innovation, if you even if you run this company. 
Absolutely, that, that's very insightful. Um, there's a question I think uh, we partially uh, responded to the question, but um, I think we can elaborate a little bit on that. Is can we use data to predict diseases? I know in the work we're doing is that we we will use data to try to predict where the outcome is of the dementia patient and use this as a benchmark to see uh, as a starting point to improvement. Uh, but I want you guys to elaborate a little bit more as on the use of data to predict the progression of disease. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, Toma, you can elaborate on this. I know something uh, you have been, I think you're working on uh, something along these lines. I think Toma. sorry. Very, it's first, it's very important for, for the audience to, and uh, I think like David explained it extremely clearly, is really like the difference between, so uh, data is uh, with on the digital health side, digital health is really apps or different programs that can help gathering data about yourself. And then you can be the one that chooses your, your own way as a consumer healthcare type of practice. And then you have machine learning, which is really like some algorithms that try to train on this data um, to learn about it. So digital health is really the apps that learn uh, your watch whatever and machine learning is really a mathematical way of analyzing the data it's so totally different you can really have digital health without machine learning and i just want to be clear clear about the the, the wording and so um, a digital health can give you give you more data points machine learning can help analyze and and you can do new things so uh, of course uh, um, um, you can data and machine learning today helps you to 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 give superpowers to researchers and physicians and to do things like predicting an outcome a survival of a patient uh, something that a physician really cannot do usually like they, i cannot tell you on a biopsy uh, of a cancer if this patient is gonna probably survive around 20 months 30 months and today the ai sometimes can really help doing so uh, because uh, what machine learning brings today is uh, what we call computer vision it's, it's really like a, a, um, a what the computer sees that the human eye doesn't see and this is really quite amazing about trying to predict making the prediction outcome research possible which means uh, predicting a disease when you only have when you only have a, a little dot on the CT scan, you can predict that the person is probably going to have a, a, a real cancer after the lung, or you can predict that he's going to have a response to a therapy. And uh, this predictive analytics and outcome using machine learning on different data points is very powerful. It doesn't work all the time, uh, but uh, it's it's amazing how the the robots and machine learning today um, and deep learning especially can see something that the human eye cannot see. And, uh, and we are discovering, rediscovering images and biopsies uh, and trying to find some patterns that just that can be predictive of an answer of a, of a response to therapy. And this is really amazing. And I think like whenever you can bring some superpowers to people like that uh, and help researchers and physicians doing things they cannot do, um, they're also like really, really interested in working with that. Um, this is really, uh, I'll just give you a last example about uh, um, brain tumors, right? Brain tumors is today. A glioblastoma is one of the worst brain tumor. It's not treatable because the tumor doesn't shrink. So you are making chemotherapy, but the tumor is always the same size. And therefore, physicians are looking at the UMRI and like, I'm not sure if you responded to the therapy or not, right? And today, like, uh, machine, and, and therefore, like all the clinical trials failed because no one knows if you're actually having a response to the drug or not. And today, uh, there's a world of we're trying to predict on, on the same images using computer vision and, and machine learning algorithm, if you're actually going to predict and respond or not, and you have the physician taking the right decision. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always statistical, right? So you're not sure about it, but you can really help in getting, having more data points in his head. It's called insights, right? Uh, and so it's, it's there is the data points of the patients and there is the data points you create in people's minds about uh, knowledge, as David said before, that help in getting different decisions and it's really helping a decision support tool um, to, to do that. So yeah, to answer the question, Philip, like you can do a lot of things in the patient uh, space today using machine learning uh, on, on different um, data points. Excellent. Uh, Dave, so you wanna... Yeah, I just want to add that, you know, um, you have two things. Now, you know, we have the artificial intelligence before we were using our own intelligence, which was, you know, sometimes limited. But <laughs> so we, we had to, you know, to use scores uh, based on, you know, hundreds, uh, thousands of, of patients that we've been developing. For instance, in, in cardiology, you, you have several scores. So we used to, you know, to have a pen and, and, and write it down, et cetera, et cetera. Now, just imagine that you have a million of people and then you can apply the score and see the trend. I mean, this this is this is amazing. And then you, as you know, uh, a, a clinician, a physician, a researcher, you can use now your human intelligence to ponderate, you know, to uh, 
uh, to mitigate this uh, this artificial intelligence and i think combined together makes you know uh, uh, either research uh, better uh, and uh, and in an exponential way but as well clinically you can help clinician and we call that clin uh, clinical decision support you can help as as a uh, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence or algorithm, you can help clinician to perform better, to have and to make better decision and probably provide uh, better treatment or more adapted treatment. Um, and, and even for research, we, we're building now a, a company that's going to, you know, democratize research uh, by looking at, at, you know, scientific papers. You know, it's really hard to be uh, now um, looking at all you know different publication every day as a physician while you treat patient it's it's almost impossible and so now having you know nuggets on information every day on your phone telling you this is the latest research um, and then you have to be aware of it that as a, as a practitioner um, this is really helpful and, and there is a big need but that you cannot do it by yourself you know you need artificial intelligence machine learning you know nlp uh, all, all those uh, those system to uh, uh, to leverage yeah we have a few a series of questions um, from, the, from, the, from the audience, one of which is um, uh, about um, COVID. Um, um, and the, the question was, is, uh, can we use uh, AI to accelerate trials? I'm not sure in the context of vaccines where you want to see immune response, you can do it. But, um, but I, I think you can use uh, AI to accelerate your understanding of the target on which uh, a, a medicine or, or vaccines needs to act on. Um, what's your take on that? Um, um, my take is today, it's, the COVID is very, a very interesting situation for understanding where AI stands. Today, on all the drugs that are out, Remdesivir, all the vaccines that has been discovered, none what has been discovered using AI. And today, probably a good chemist, still a lot better than any AI algorithm. Why? Because the AI algorithm doesn't really have the right data sets of COVID to be trained on, the molecular data sets. They don't have the knowledge. They don't integrate some quantum physics that understand the binding and everything. So AI for drug discovery today is not perfect. And we can see with, uh, with uh, uh, drug discoveries, there's a lot of things that are tried, how you repurpose a drug on uh, trying to use it for COVID and some progress I made, but today the best drugs were just discovered by a really good chemist and, and nothing else. Um, so um, the, it's, it's really like one of the things about AI, sometimes a bit overhyped. Uh, it can bring a lot, but not always. Um, uh, what it was helpful for was the triage thing. So how can you uh, try to predict who is going to need some oxygen uh, ICU, who is going to need to be intensive care, who is going to need like some intense oxygen therapy. And this is something that AI has been trying to be helpful with. And uh, using your CT scan when you enter the hospital, we're quite able today to tell you if you're going to be very severe or not very severe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is quite helpful, but it needs to be compared to other scores, as David says, clinician scores, other scores that can be done. Uh, sometimes just a clinical feeling and instinct, which is very powerful. And, um, and is it that useful? There is a really good paper in Lancet saying that sometimes AI is trying to find solutions uh, to problems that are non existent or trying to actually so you know it's it's really, you need to really uh, have a real problem and trying to solve it with AI and not having a solution and then trying to find what problem you're solving it with and it can be a little bit true with AI in general uh, where, where it did bring some value is in what I call about the federated learning space because uh, trying to use the machine learning to train models without having people to share the data so what we develop at Okin it means people like literally like keep the data on premise and therefore they can collaborate sharing the model of AI but the data stays in the servers of the hospitals and why was this important for COVID just because people did not want to share data a lot uh, because it was very competitive people wanted to publish like a lot it was really really competitive people like nature medicine had like 40 times more papers I don't know the numbers it was really huge so um, um, today like it has been a very competitive uh, setting and you could think that people wanted to collaborate and exchange data but no they were like I'm keeping my data but if you are coming to them and saying, okay, you can keep your data, but we can still like find a collective intelligence and you don't need to share them, that was kind of okay. So there was this machine learning federated and uh, based on federated models could work. But today the, there is no revolution using AI in the COVID space today whatsoever. Maybe David has okay. but my, my... a few. No, I think I think it's 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 really clear, you know, you you say that um, data are everywhere, uh, like COVID, right? So we cannot access data in 
uh, in Europe, in China, in the US at the same time. So it's really hard to, you know, to train uh, artificial intelligence in less than six months without sharing all those data. So you, you say that clearly, and then I think your model is brilliant at Oaken, and, and you know, that's where you can really democratize AI and machine learning. And I think you can apply not only to healthcare, but to, to many other, other type of data uh, for, you know, for the audience that are not focusing on healthcare. But, but what I think is without looking specifically for treatment or for vaccine, you know, those global uh, data uh, can be now utilized and, and leverage, you know, machine learning to understand, you know, some pattern, maybe in terms of policies, right? What policies work or not in terms of global population? Maybe not for the drug discovery, but sometimes, you know, policies, uh, national policies are more important to protect the population than uh, drug discovery. And so that's where, you know, you can think, you know, more global, and look at treatment and vaccine as one part, but as well in the global ecosystem, how do you leverage those data? You know, thinking about the people who are sick, the people who are not sick, the biology of the one of the patient and the, the biomarkers of the healthy population. But that's where the patterns, you know, how do they live? How do they react, you know, in front of a new, a new pandemic? And all those data are really interesting because now you can, you can analyze the behavior of population different behavior in uh, Latin America uh, compared to Southeast Asia, right? And Europe and the US, of course. So those behavior maybe can predict, you know, further pandemic and when and how should we react as policymaker uh, and healthcare system, uh, you know, thanks to, thanks to AI. So I think that this is a perspective. I don't think uh, it, it's, I, I'm not aware of something that has been done so far because this is so new, right? So, but but in the next you know in the next years we'd be able to uh, to analyze all those data and predict you know future pandemics and and probably uh, inform population and government on what to do. And can I just add one thing, Philip, just to that very quickly? And sure. I think it's, it's uh, in the terms of predicting pandemics and understanding how you can use it uh, for using machine learning and AI. You need a lot of data, right? You cannot really use. And so, um, uh, for example, like there is like it's important to understand uh, um, the difference also about technology and process. It's funny to say it, but <laughs> sometimes, you know, like take the example of Ebola. If you want to understand how Ebola can be better detected in Congo, for example, when there was a few cases spread out, but you needed to detect them quite easy to not to, to avoid a big pandemic. Uh, what was needed? It was not technology. It was just processes and operations. And uh, I had the experience of eating with the, 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 the leader of WHO, Tedros, and he was like, he, he, he took 15 people of the tech in New York and he was explaining, we're going to use machine learning to detect, you know, like the Ebola cases. And we were like, why? And it's like, you need processes and operations. And sometimes, you know, really good operations, uh, how you can detect, how do you can have, have exactly know about it. And, and, uh, and it's very complex. And sometimes, you know, process are much harder tasks than building some algorithm that won't be useful anyway. <laughs> so I think it's also important to remember that technology has a lot of limits. And it's not the solution to everything in every situation. And maybe David is you know, way better at all these countries than myself, so he might have a lot of experience about that, about mm. processes that are well done. But I think it's important to remember that it's still part of the solution. Got it. Still on the topic, um, there's a question is, um, so we heard, a, we spoke about the use of AI in, for, in large organizations, hospitals, research organizations, policy making. Um, do you see in a short term, is it uh, a use of AI for at the GP level, your, 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 your personal doctor? You think that, is there a benefit to it? And if, and if yes, and do you believe that AI will make its way into the GP office anytime soon? I think it's almost, it's almost already here, right? <laughs> if you look at, there is, there is several company already that if you look at AI, we call that sometimes the bot, right? Bot like like a robot, and and then you can have there is probably a, already a, a thousand app on the Apple Store or or other you know platform where you can download and a bot which is a robot based on AI without going into details that asks you question, right? And if you answer one question, I'm a male, you know, I'm 40 years old and I have a chest pain, then they're going to tell me something. Uh, you know, in terms of triage, they're going to tell me, oh, if it's a really severe uh, chest pain, call 911, right? So already this 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 process 
is part of AI, right? And already, uh, instead of calling my doctor, I'm calling an app, I'm calling a robot, and I'm answering some question to somebody that doesn't exist, right? But that replace right now, uh, of course, the, the doctor. Um, I don't think, um, I don't think we're going to have robots that's going to treat the global population. But what I'm saying is not the future. This is the present already. It exists. It exists in the US. It exists in, in several countries in Africa already. If you look at Babylon, Babylon Health, uh, you have an app and then you can talk to a doctor. But first, you, you talk to a bot. You click where you, uh, if you have, uh, you know, abdominal pain, you click on, on the abdomen, right? If you have a migraine, you keep it on the head, right? So that's the robot that asks you questions. So I think, yes, you already exist. I think that's going to accelerate, uh, you know, the triage. Um, probably in in uh, in a general context, in in, uh, in on the continent, or let's say on in countries where you don't have access to a lot of doctors, right? Um, this is great. This is in the medical desert uh, as well. You you have that in France. You have that in the US. Not not everybody can just walk out, you know, his his house and knock to a GP office, uh, a general practitioner. So if you have somebody that can help you. Uh, whether it, uh, you know, it can be an app, it can be a, an algorithm, a bot, uh, I think it helps already. And then in the, in the next future, um, like I said, I always say that we're going to be our own doctor. And that's what we do, right? right? I have migraine, I Google it, I look at all the podcasts, I look at all the, you know, the website, this is what you have to do, blah, blah, blah. And if it doesn't work, then you, maybe you call your doctor. So we are our first doctor. And then some, you know, artificial intelligence is the our assistant, and then if that doesn't work, then we call the uh, we call our you know the real doctor. And so you know everybody in the audience can think about it. I'm sure you all always did it. You know my son, my daughter, my wife, or my husband had something. What do I do? I Google it, right? Or you know then no nap. Uh, so I think it's already here. It was there before COVID. Uh, now it's uh, look, it's really amplified. Um, and you know nobody can go to a hospital right now, you know, for elective on maybe 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 two days, but two months ago was impossible was impossible. So what we used it was uh, telehealth and telehealth now imply as well sometimes artificial intelligence and probably you know Thomas can go surely deeper. Uh, it's not the same artificial intelligence a boat and then developing you know drugs and research is totally different uh, process. But uh, it's already here. Medical office use AI, right? Yeah, yeah. But I also think that uh, some so the, the, at the GP level, um, so there is some specialties like radiologists. He will disappear. I mean, like mostly, right? There will still be for some biopsies, whatever. But most of the radiology will be replaced by AI. So today, if you're a radiologist and you don't really, you're not interested to understand how AI. Uh, is working, you're probably not interested in understanding how you're going to be replaced. That's a real if, it's for sure. <laughs> uh, and AI is doing better to the stroke than the radiologist or whatever. Uh, I think on the GP level, um, yeah, there is also something that it will be different. The GP is not going to be replaced tomorrow by AI, uh, and it's better because AI should be an assistant. But what I think is very, I mean, should assist and help. But what I think is very important is the black box effect. Is uh, if you want physicians like GPs to use AI, I think what is the level of understanding of the models? Um, I just get one example, and I take a cardiovascular example, so David can can tell me if, he, if it's uh, if it's relevant. Uh, but uh, uh, just imagine that I can predict, we can predict if somebody's going to have a relapse uh, uh, of a cardiovascular event, a stroke, or an infarct, uh, with a 97% accuracy. But you need to enter 120 features in the model. Uh, you come from nowhere, you travel, you eat at Burger King, uh, whatever, which absolutely I make no sense. But when they combine together, it makes a model that can predict really well if you're going to make something very bad and you can act on it. Uh, but if you're a GP and you know, oh my God, I have to enter that. He actually ate at Burger King. What the fuck? Is that? What? And, but uh, are you going to buy it? Are you going to still use it? Uh, and I think this is called the black box effect. Do the models need to be very simple and just enter some uh, models like he smokes, he's a man, like some cardiovascular risks that are more common. And, and you know, and sometimes just today, uh, some people say, but if it's accurate, we don't care to enter 120 features that don't make sense. It's black box, but it works. So are we ready to, to use things that we don't understand? I think it's very important. And, and physicians today, they kind of like to understand what's the story and what's the features and how it works, which makes sense, I think. And I like it too. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a limit of the, the use of AI at a daily basis by GPs, for example. But my take. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's all a matter of productivity, better outcome and less, less investment. And investment means everything, you know, time, 
uh, finance and and uh, and knowledge. So whenever you give access as well to the to those data to the entry point and look, imagine I'm a patient and I put all my data in my phone before going to the GP and the GP just have a score, right? And and they say, oh, he's at risk. David is at risk because I get all the data. He doesn't have to enter the data. I don't have to spend the time to ask the question I've you know already asked in the in the survey. Then you optimize uh, the, you know the, the productivity and probably the the clinical outcome uh, uh, of of the patient uh, and uh, and the physician. So to your point, Thomas, it, it has to be something that is really well understood by the physician because he's going to prescribe it to his patient but as well simple to use and a great experience for the patient uh, to be able to share those information uh, directly with the GP before he even gets to the, to the office, uh, if he goes, if he goes. Yeah. I have a, um, I'm going to switch gear. I have a, a, a last question and I'm going to actually blend two questions into one. And it is about um, wellness and well-being for employees. But also, when it comes to wellness and well-being for employees, where you have more and more access to information, what's also go back to the privacy. So what moving forward, and maybe David, you can take this, how everyone, every corporation should think about moving forward their wellness and well-being strategy for the employees and, and what's their responsibilities in terms of privacy? Okay, so let's start, let's start with, um, let's start, um, so either, either we start with privacy and data, either we start globally. So let's start globally and then we go to, to privacy. And I, I, uh, I think Thomas has a lot to say about this. So if you, look at, if you look at the company, right? When you're a leader of a company, one, what you want is your company to be at, at the best shape, right? Um, and it means you know, really being really competitive, productive, and deliver a great product for your, your customer or service. Um, you can only do that uh, if you have great human beings that you know uh, support and that you empower to make this uh, this work happen uh, at your company. And and I think employees are the the wealth of you know the of the company. So if you look at it in a way right now where you know if you had COVID, if you have let's say you have COVID right now, okay, you spend three weeks in a bed. What ha what happens to your daily job? Right, your productivity is down 100%. Right, you go you go to maybe let's say 80% productivity to zero because you can't work. So I think when we say health is wealth, it applies as well for companies and businesses and even for government. You know, you have to be healthy to perform your your task, you perform your duty, to perform your service. And and I think you know taking care of the health and the well-being globally as your employee uh, or your collaborator. Is not only looking, you know, uh, of the, uh, you know, looking at the, the cardiovascular disease, you know, risk. It's about the well-being. How do they feel inside uh, this company? Do they feel comfortable? Do they feel, uh, you know, uh, enthusiastic working every day? Not all those parameters. This is not a doctor's job, right? And so that's where now there is a fine, you know, uh, let, let's say there, there's no limit between being healthy and well-being and then being productive at work. So I think this, this is a, really three things is the, the, the empowerment and you have to empower your employee to stay healthy, be productive. Well-being, you have to create a whole culture of, of uh, you know, uh, of, uh, of well-being in, uh, in your company. And it goes from, you know, providing technology uh, to make sure that uh, you have access to the great uh, uh, to the great diagnosis, but as well health insurance, right? A lot of people right now is saying, okay, I'm going to work for this company. What is the health insurance package, right? Uh, do I have free yoga classes? Do you have a membership gym, right? So now I think that's a criteria to, uh, and then maybe in the next, you know, in the next few years we're gonna we're gonna look at companies in the impact of health and well-being. You know, 10 years ago was the culture. Do you have a ping pong table? In your office, right? Google was and Facebook, they were all about the culture. Now, you know, with COVID, everybody knows that healthcare and health is you know, the, your most precious asset. So, how, as a company, you're going to promote the health and well being of your employee? Is that with the ping pong table, you know, or bold messages on the door? Or is that by providing access to knowledge, to health literacy, access to well being, you know, benefit? 
and probably as well protecting the data, right? So if you're an employer, you don't have the right to know, you know, if I had COVID or not, right? But you can make sure that, you know, I have as an employee all the tools that are necessary to test myself, right? To be able to treat myself without having to spend a lot of money, being able to work in a, in a you know, in a safe condition, being protected, you know, being sh making sure that my global environment has all the protective equipment, you know, that we can be screened if we want to without even sharing the data, but to make sure that we feel safe, that we are safe, and then we are protecting as well the company towards either, you know, for the retail uh, companies, you know, towards the customer, right? You want to make sure as an employee, you know, I get maximum, you know, safety and health safety and coverage to make sure that my customer is going to be protected when they're going to come to my restaurant, when they're going to come to my, you know, uh, my retail store, or they're going to fly on my airline. You want to know that. And customer, they want to know as well, the company is treating the employee well, and they are protecting them. So well, I got a call from a large, uh, a large uh, grocery chain in, in Europe saying, how can I protect my employee? It was at the beginning of COVID. I said, first is information. You have to make sure that you communicate internally and externally in a way that you provide the right information, the right education for your employee first, right? Because they are the ones that are running your company. They are the one, the workforce that are producing for you, right? So I think this, this is really the first step. Information, education, protection, and then uh, uh, empowering them. And if they need, then they can have access, access to services that you might provide and leveraging technology, right? Making a partnership with a you know, health tech startup or a service you know, company that's going to provide anything that is needed for the, uh, uh, for the company. Excellent. So John said we could go a little bit over. We over. I wanted to make sure that we cover most questions. So uh, John, um, yeah, I, I think uh, we are way over now, but you said we could. Um, uh, there's no uh, new questions, so I think we could stop the meeting here. John? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, David, Leap, and Thomas. Um, Thomas, I don't know if there's a final point that you wanted to get in um, before we, we say goodbye um, on the privacy aspect, um, just to, to cover that. No, no, I'm good. I think we went through it. I think the privacy okay, is good. mediation. And so I'm good. Thank you. Great. Well, then, um, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for being here and spending the better part of an hour of your day going over the different aspects of different types of technology and how it you know, can really help us from a, a doctor to a, a personal level as far as healthcare. So I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, give us, giving us some insight there. And to the... Um, to the attendees, thank you for your excellent questions. I uh, really appreciate the engagement and uh, the participation. Um, I hope that you enjoy the conversations and I hope your questions were answered sufficiently. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all at our next uh, webinar on September 10th on, um, on cultural and uh, breaking through a borderless world. Uh, Philippe, David, and Thomas, thank you once more. Um, again, really appreciate it and looking forward to speaking to you all soon. All right, thank you. It was a pleasure. Merci, merci et à bientôt. Merci. Merci. Bye, thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you.